Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And for natural resources today, we're going to talk about hydropower and geothermal energy. We'll also talk about tide, tidal power. Um, so these are alternatives to solar and wind. And I shouldn't say alternatives because if they were used together in many regions, um, we'd probably be able to uh, wean ourselves off of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, maybe not completely, but instead of being utilizing fossil fuels for 90% of our energy, maybe we could get down to 10% of our energy as fossil fuels and 90% is renewable resources. Now that being said, um, we have a lot of work to do if that is the future um, of our country. Now that might not be the the way the United States wants to go and for that matter that might not be the way the world wants to go. Um, we will run out of fossil fuels eventually so we'll have to change something but there are other means out there that can utilize biofuels to maybe combat that fossil fuel situation. Alright, so let's look at hydropower. So in 1925, about 40 percent of the world's electric power was hydro. Okay? And that was the most um, in modern times. Well, um, we've never been that high uh, since 1925. That doesn't mean that hydro is not increasing. It is. It's increased since 1925 15 fold. So 15 times um, the capacity of what it was in 25 is what it is at today. But the reason why we're not at 40% is because fossil fuels have increased like 50 fold, 100 fold, 200 fold, depending on the region. And um, now hydro depends on where you're at, but hydro supplies about 20% of electrical generation. Now in some states in the United States or some countries, um, it's, it's far more than 20%. For example, Norway is at 99% hydro. Um, they're a completely re renewable resource, Norway is. Um, but, you know, Washington State, uh, Oregon, California, a lot of these places have large rivers that have been dammed um, get more than 20% of their electrical generation via hydro. <clears throat> there are a lot of places in the world that um, don't have hydropower yet or have very little hydropower. Um, places like Central America and um, Southern America, your potential is great there because of the massive rivers that are running through that, those regions. But you'll see as we move on that most people, most modern hydrobiologists or hydroelectricians are not thinking about the big ones, the big rivers, but rather can we install smaller hydropower facilities on on little streams and and small rivers and things like that? So places like Africa, India, China, they could all be established um, hydropower um, in the near future. We'll see how that goes. Okay. Um, most hydropower that of recent times, really since twenty five, have came from these massive dams. Huge dams, huge turbines, um, massive amount of water pressure to turn those turbines and generate electricity. So the enormous dams is where most of the hydropower is coming from recent years. Now there are issues with having enormous dams and most of you probably are familiar with some of those issues because they make the news quite often First of all, people live on rivers. Um, indigenous people live on rivers. And, um, well, pretty much everyone lives on a river or near a water source. And what we find out that when we construct dams is that 
most of the time there's at least a small population or sometimes even a large population of humans that need to be moved okay? because that, that dam is going to take that new lake is going to take up a huge amount of area okay? that was once inhabited so you get ecosystem destruction on top of that so you get the building of the dam but not just building of the dam um, you know the fact that you just flooded a massive amount of water, land habitat um, so you lose wildlife you lose wildlife um, from a couple of reasons first of all you just you know you're destroying the ecosystem so you get loss of wildlife that way but now you you're constructing a giant um, brick wall giant cement wall that prevents fish movement and, and can change water sources and things like that. Now, that being said, wildlife loss does occur, but you can also have introduction of new wildlife species. By creating a giant lake, you get, you know, uh, migrating birds that will visit that lake more often. Um, this can be problematic, but it also can be beneficial. Uh, you can get other fish species that you've introduced um, into the fish to take, or into the lake to take, um, you know, to take up this new habitat and fill the void that you have because you lost the native fish species. And this happens all over. Uh, mainly the western part of the United States is probably most famous for this, replacing things like cutthroat trout. Um, salmon with uh, bass, so largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, or even replacing them with another trout species like rainbow trout. Um, and you get a lot of replacement of the native fish from the fact that you dammed up a, a major river. Right. And the other thing that you always have the potential for is if the dam fails, you're going to have large-scale flooding and you're going to have mass destruction. Um, sedimentation is a problem in many regions because a lot of the rivers that are dammed up have really heavy flow um, for part of the year, maybe in the spring. Um, and that means they're carrying massive amounts of sediment with them and you'll get sedimentation, which means you either remove that or you'll get the failure of the dam. The other thing is, is depending on where uh, the dam and where the construction has been done, you can have accumulation, bioaccumulation of things like herbicides and pesticides and, and fertilizer into the reservoir or into you know the new lake that's formed from the tributaries coming in. So before, where these tributaries might be carrying. Uh, herbicides and fertilizers and things from nearby fields and people's lawns and, and whatnot and streets and things like that. Before when it was carrying it in, well, because that's a running system, that's a flowing system, it would just be carried out and it dissipate out and some people might say, well, then it's someone else's problem. Well, eventually it makes it to the ocean and the ocean is a much bigger body source of water that can dilute a lot of those pollutants. But what you have, have when you dam the river up is now you have an accumulation in that body of water. And so because you're accumulating a lot of those pesticides, herbicides, other things into that water, you can get um, algae blooms, you can get big fish kill-offs, things like that. Okay. And then we've seen this a lot in places like California, which has quite a few dams. Um, you get huge amounts of evaporative loss in regions where you have hot um, summers or you know very arid environments. You're going to get a lot of evaporation coming off. Now that water's not lost because remember, water is just changing shape. It's changing form, just like energy. You're not losing it, right? but you're moving it and removing it from the system. So when you get evaporation coming off of these reservoirs, that evaporation is going to feed a different region. So an environment where that water, that water used to be utilized 
by the trees and the organisms and things like that in that region is no longer getting to utilize that water. That water is being evaporated off and either you know rained back over the ocean or on some mountainsides or something like that away from the region where the water existed. Okay? And so you can get some changes of the climate. Okay? <clears throat> So what are the unwanted effects of dams? Clearly I just went through some of them, but you know you can get a lot of that nutrient loading um, and buildup of sedimentation, both vegetation and just silt or um, you know small particulate matter, things like rocks and, and mud and things like that. You can get buildup, which can ca cause um, big algae blooms, uh, which will cause fish die off. Uh, it can also cause uh, the acid levels, acidifies the water, it can produce greenhouse gases because you're getting this rotting flesh, or you're getting this rotting material that's occurring in the water, uh, evaporating off uh, methane and things like that. So it can be problematic in that sense. The other thing that happens when we utilize not major dams like we do in the United States so much, but in other countries like China and places like that where we've tried to utilize more low head dams to, you know, maybe block off a little stream, flood a field, so things like rice and other crops can be grown with adequate water. You can get problems with diseases. Uh, like parasites like schistosoma and other things which you know a lot of these diseases will live in snails. Snails need slow moving water so by damming it up it's allowing uh, snails to regenerate very quickly in these regions. Snails eat things like uh, algae and paraphyton and, and things like that and so when you allow for a lot of sun to come in to shallow water you overproduce these snails and these snails will carry these flukes and then these flukes can be transferred into humans sometimes it's transferred into humans that are working in that region like in the water specifically other times it might be transferred to humans via the vegetation that's in the water that maybe they're growing or sometimes the water that they're drinking. Um, in all cases, some of these diseases, some of these parasites, since they don't, since they, since they didn't really evolve with humans, you can get Chinese liver fluke, you can get a um, a fluke, uh, brain fluke that cause, you can get kidney flukes, you can get all kinds of flukes that will eventually kill an individual because they're consuming that material either the brain, the liver, the kidneys, that's where they're going to reside, that's what they're going to eat, and eventually you die of liver failure, kidney failure, brain disease, um, <clears throat> and whatnot. So it can be very problematic when you make these small dams to dam up these springs or, or small streams and things like that uh, for that purpose. Often those will be coupled with not just flooding an area for cropping, but the potential to also generate a little bit of electricity off of these moving waters. And then, like I said before, you know, just an added effect is, you know, most people, when they establish themselves on a piece of land, they establish themselves next to water. And it's one of the, you know, it's one of the givens. If you look at all the major cities, they're on waterways um, or really close to waterways or have waterways that, um, you know, ways that water can get to them, like, you know, Vegas and things like that, where they've, you know, pumped water into the region. Uh, so indigenous people, people establish themselves on these waterways and, and then often are displaced because that waterway is a good way to generate power. This doesn't have to be the case. There are alternatives to dams. You can still use hydropower, but you can use low head hydropower. Um, 
So this is just a small dam, and I just talked about some of the issues with this, though, if you're damming regions and you're cropping with it, or uh, the water's shallow enough that snails can get established, and there's enough energy in the system, you could create disease outbreaks. Okay? Apart from just schistosoma, I mean, you have small bodies of water like that, you increase the amount of mosquitoes, which could increase the amount of malaria, you could increase the amount of titsy flies, which could increase the amount of, um, depending on the region, what it's called, but African sleeping sickness, or sometimes just called um, sleeping sickness. And, and so in all cases, you can introduce a new habitat for parasites and problems to, devo to develop in, in situations where you might be using low head hydropower dams. An alternative to that would be like a run-of-the-river flow or run-of-the-river hydropower where you're putting small turbines inside the river okay? and it's not damming up the river. It doesn't change the flow of the river. Well, m in most cases, it doesn't change the flow of the river. And it also allows for native fish and things like that to move freely um, along the river. Now, the problem with a lot of these is you also have to have a way to get the energy from the turbine. So you have to run lines and things like that. And um, We'll talk about problems when it comes to that. Okay? Probably the most uh, recent advantage is what we call micro hydro generators. And these are designed to generate enough electricity for like a single home. Um, small generators that you can put in a small stream that's running next to the home. It doesn't change. It doesn't divert the water. It doesn't change the waterway in any any real form. You're just util utilizing that natural flow of the stream to turn a very small turbine, and that turbine will run, uh, you know, a single ho home or maybe even a couple homes, depending on the energy need of that and you know that region. Now one of the problems that we've seen in the United States is when we've talked about low head power or run of the river we've seen that subsidies from the government that were put in place have allowed individuals to divert rivers and streams so because they say you know individuals have said well I'm going to put a small low head power or hydropower dam in, I got to divert this over this way to my property. So now not only are they getting energy, electricity, they're also stealing water. Um, and so they'll, they'll crop with water that they don't have rights to, but because of the subsidies that have been put, put, put in place in, in some situations, they can utilize water resources that are not theirs. Alright, so we're going to watch a little video about this micro hydro generators and you can be the judge of whether or not um, this technology is going to change the world or not. Water, it's the one thing we all need. And frankly, our whole society, all the villages and all of our cities can be found near running water. Now what else does our society like a lot? Well, clean energy of course. Wind and solar are great, but they can't beat the cheap and continuous energy output of hydropower. Sadly, however, over time hydro has become less sustainable by focusing on high-pressure turbines with dams. So hi, my name is Geert and I'm the co-founder of Turbland. And together with my other co-founders, we have built ourselves a team of people who want to make hydropower green again. Inspired by nature, we have made a turbine that uses the power of the vortex to create clean energy from rivers without harming the fish. We can do this because we only require a 1.5 meter height difference, making a low pressure turbine that is easy to install in every kind of river. The operation of the turbine is very simple. The water flows in, creates a vortex that then turns a specially designed rotor to extract the energy and turn it into electricity. Over the past years, we have proven the high efficiency of these turbines in the lab, tested their reliability 
in the rivers of Belgium and we are now developing small 5 kW turbines in rural areas of Chile to power Mapuche Indian communities. We also started to scale the turbine size to 15, 30 and 100 kW to be able to build megawatt size cascades of turbines along the length of the canals providing reliable energy to all the surrounding farmers and villages. Turbulent energy solutions are designed for a better world while having a positive economic, social and environmental impact. Okay, so there you can see a company called Turbulent. Uh, there are other companies out there that have similar kind of vortex um, micro hydro generators. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the cost of some of these are. It depends on the subsidy that you can get. In some regions um, around the world, they're free. And so the governments of those regions want to see electricity to villages and things like that so the government actually picks up the cost. Um, in the United States I'm sure uh, there's no subsidy for some of these um, so you'd be picking up the cost yourself. But nonetheless um, it's another source, another alternative to a dam. Okay, let's look at geothermal energy. This is um, fairly new for many people although the technology is really old and it's been around for a very long time. Right. Now geothermal energy works in a couple forms. First you can have direct geothermal energy which means that you're tapping things like hot springs and geysers and things like that. So if you've ever been to Yellowstone you'd be tapping you know Old Faithful probably not Old Faithful but some of the other geysers or hot springs that are constantly um, running energy okay, or utilizing energy and you tap them to drive turbines just like all the other systems okay? instead of burning fossil fuel to create steam to turn a turbine okay? in this case you just utilize the planet steam itself to run a turbine okay? um, so it's completely renewable as long as you get, the guys are last but well, they should last at least our lifetime um, <clears throat> the problem is is it's very localized okay? you have to be in a very distinct environment okay, to utilize geothermal energy in this form okay? which means that you know you have to be next to geysers you have to be next to hot springs um, and so it, it's not a source of energy that every person on the planet can utilize in the sense of this kind of ge geothermal energy. Now, the other type of geothermal energy is to just utilize the Earth's natural temperature difference. Okay? Now this it can be utilized anywhere in the world and that is to design a heat pump okay, at the individual house level. Okay, so now we're talking about utilizing the temperature of the planet about five feet down. Okay? The temperature of the planet about five feet down, it doesn't really matter what it's on the surface, it could be minus 30, about five feet down it's going to be roughly 50 degrees and 50 degrees is enough of a difference that you can start utilizing that and drive a heat pump to heat a house or 50 degrees is plenty cool to utilize some of that to cool your house in the middle of the summer okay? and it's stable at roughly 50, 45, 48 degrees depends on the region but and, and the soil type and, and you know the actual construction of whatever system you're running, whether you're running um, like antifreeze or, or you're running water through the piping and things like that. But nonetheless, still 45 to 50 degrees, somewhere in that range, year round, constantly. Um, and that's going to be utilized um, at the individual house level. Okay? And when I say this technology is old, People have done geothermal systems 
in their homes for years. Um, you know, probably started maybe in the 50s and maybe even before that. Okay, um, people were just digging deep wells and utilizing the natural temperature difference between the two systems. So you can do it a couple ways. You can do what we call a deep well system, where you're going really deep and utilizing the geothermal system. Or you can just do like a, um, a flat ground where you're just burying pipe five feet under and utilizing you know, the difference in the five feet zone. Now, there's a couple different ways. But remember that in this system, geothermal energy it's never going to be exhausted. Well, let me back up. It will be exhausted when the planet's gone. Okay? And so until that happens, this energy can be utilized forever. Um, and you know, the homes that have went this way have probably cut their heating and cooling costs by half. Right? And so um, they've utilized this natural system and it pays for itself very quickly because the system itself is fairly efficient as long as, or fairly cheap, inexpensive, as long as you're installing it kind of at the beginning. At, you know, at the beginning of designing your home or, you know, the, there the cost is pretty efficient um, and inexpensive. If you're coming back later and you're trying to install it after other things have been done and you already have different systems then the cost can be a little bit higher um, but nonetheless I'm going to show you a little video about how this heat pump system works um, and it's fairly efficient in the sense that you're just utilizing natural temperature differences in the soil um, or actually the lack of temperature differences in the soil um, but the temperature will differ from the house to the soil, and so you can utilize that 50 degrees Fahrenheit to drive energy into the house. Okay, so let's watch a little video on that. Well, the key component for any of these geothermal heat pumps is to have some interaction with the ground, so it needs some sort of well. One type of well is a closed loop filled with antifreeze that circulates horizontally about 5 to 10 feet below the surface. Or you can install the same closed loop of antifreeze vertically into a well that may go down hundreds of feet. A third option is to have an open loop in which groundwater, not antifreeze, is pumped out of the ground through the heat pump and then returned to the ground. The key for any of these loops, though, is that we're always going to find 50 degree temperature both winter and summer under the ground. Yeah, but I don't know many people who think that 50 degrees is a comfortable temperature to keep the house in the winter. Right, but that's where the heat pump comes in. We're going to use the basic refrigeration cycle that we see in every window air conditioner, every refrigerator, even to cool our cars, to use that 50 degree water to make your house comfortable. The water or antifreeze is pumped into the heat pump, and in the winter, the heat is transferred to a closed loop of liquid refrigerant. That refrigerant now goes into a compressor, which uses electricity to compress the liquid refrigerant, turning it into a gas and making it very hot, maybe 130 to 150 degrees. In a typical forced air application, air is blown across the coils of that hot gas, heating the house. The refrigerant is then cooled by the air, and it turns back into a liquid, and the process repeats. The same equipment can be used to cool the house in the summer, simply by pumping the refrigerant in the opposite direction. All right, so I get the theory of how they work, but what do the systems look like? Well, recently, I took a homeowner to see one of these geothermal systems in operation. So we got an email from you curious about geothermal heat pumps and you're building a new house. That's right. I just recently bought uh, some property on our lake and right. I'm in the planning stage of the heating system. Well, I thought I would bring you here. This homeowner about six years ago decided to put in a geothermal heat pump. That's a ground source heat pump. Now, most people might know a heat pump because it might have equipment like this on the outside. This is called a condenser. Now, when it's in air conditioning mode, heat is absorbed from inside the building into these refrigerant lines and it dumps to outside. When it's a heat pump, it, it also can reverse, and it can actually can be looking for heat from outside to be absorbed into the refrigerant to go into the building. The problem is it gets really cold here, and there's not much heat to be had. How cold does it get around here? It's freezing most of the time That's right. in the winter. 
So now with geothermal, we actually could use the heat that is below our feet, down under the ground. Once you get down to four or five feet down, it's about 45 to 50 degrees down there. So now, now you've got to figure out how you're going to collect that energy. So you could put a bunch of pipes down, five feet down, to collect the energy. You could do a closed loop, but this homeowner chose to put a well like this. This is actually about 400 feet down. At the very bottom of it, there's a pump, and it's going to take that water and pump it up and go into the house where we can use it to heat the building. Let me show you. The pipe actually comes into right here. So here's that 50 degree water that's going to come in. It comes across the ceiling, and now it goes right over to here, and it comes down into this heat pump right here. Now inside this heat pump, there's a heat exchanger, and there's the basic refrigeration equipment that we see in every refrigerator or air conditioner. So what happens is that heat exchanger picks up that 50 degree temperature, and now it gets absorbed into the refrigerant. Now when that refrigerant gets compressed and get really hot, that 50 can be, a, be 120 or 130 degrees. So now that hotter refrigerant comes over here, and now when that air blows across it, it can actually heat the air enough to heat the building. Refrigerant gets cooler, goes back to that 50 degree water, picks up more temperature and the cycle continues. In the summer it's just the opposite. It picks up heat from inside the building, now it takes it back and it dumps all that heat down under the ground and back into another well outside. Okay, so there you can see a heat pump geothermal energy system um, and how they work. Uh, I will say, when I, when I say it's old technology, it's, it's really old technology. In actuality, if you look at other countries, um, this is standard equipment for other countries like Germany. Um, when they build a new house, this is automatically installed in the house. They s install a heat pump system in the house. This allows them, you know, half the energy costs uh, that we spend when we don't have one. And I'd say that, you know, 99% of the houses in the United States probably do not have a heat pump system. Okay. Now, you know, why is Germany is just as cold as pretty much every single place, coldest places in the United States. It works fine there. Um, it works fine in the Arctic. Uh, you know, you might have to go a little bit deeper down in some of these regions. Um, but for the most part, uh, the system's always, uh, always available. And so, you know, one way to cut a lot of energy costs is by installing something like this in new buildings. Okay. <clears throat> now, other things that people, scientists are starting to get ideas with come with tidal energy or wave energy. Okay, we know that the tides and the waves are very consistent. There's a massive amount of energy that can be harnessed. We just got to find a way to do this. So there are a couple different designs. Um, you can have what we call tidal stations where you have tides that will flow through turbines and generate electricity. Okay. And, but the problems with that is you have to have a, a fairly big difference in high tide and low tide. Okay, so you got to have these stations that are going to be affected by a large amount of water moving through because most of the time the turbines that are used are big. So it's much like a dam that has really big turbines that needs a massive amount of water to come through. Tidal stations are the same thing. You could do this on an individual level very easily. So if you had a beach house you could run a tidal station um, on your, your beach house and utilize the energy coming off the high tide, low tide um, from you know small turbine system. Okay? Much like you would if you're just generating energy off of a small stream that's next to your cabin or house or whatever, you're utilizing smaller turbines. But if we're going to do this in, in, in a large situation and feed a bunch of houses and buildings and things like that, you have to have a huge difference between the tides. Um, so the energy itself, there are regions of the world that we already know that harness huge waves um, and could really give a lot of energy to the, to the system. Um, one that we're pursuing is Hawaii. Uh, there is a couple groups at the University of Hawaii that are trying to design tidal wave systems, tidal stations,
that will generate enough energy for the all the islands, the Hawaiian islands, um, just off of uh, tides or wave energy. But there are places where you have small communities that are utilizing this technology. Washington State, there's a couple communities and a couple beach house um, facilities, I guess. Uh, I don't know what you want to call them, housing units, that they have a tidal station nearby that supplements some of their energy, energetic needs of this community. Uh, you can see that that's probably going to become much more popular uh, as time goes and as uh, fossil fuel prices keep increasing. So what you're going to eventually get is we'll get to a point where uh, we have to ration fossil fuels and um, you're going to start to see enormous costs when it comes to fossil fuels and so things like this could mediate some of those costs. So here this is the Pilamas um, wave converter. So this is another system that is being designed and so the system really undulates and so it moves back and forth like this and that uh, pumps a liquid back and forth okay, which spins turbines, creates electricity and electricity is pumped back. Um, you have to have enough wave action to cause that undulation, but nonetheless, this isn't disturbing, well, at least right now, it's not disturbing fish habitat. Um, fish can swim around it. You know, it's not changing whale patterns or anything like that. Um, ships can move around this, but it's still generating electricity constantly, all day, every day. Um, and uh, we're utilizing the ocean's power to drive that system. Now, <clears throat> a lot of these systems, the problem that we find ourselves in, especially in the United States, is we don't, we're not going to generate power where we actually need it. Okay? The eastern part of the United States is heavily populated and has a massive amount of power needs. That's why that's where most of our coal plants are, most of the nuclear plants are, etc. Most of the renewable resources and energy is probably going to come from the western part of the United States. That's where uh, the major rivers are that we could utilize hydro. That's where the most sunlight is. It's where, um, well, the Midwest and the western part is where the majority of the wind currents are, heavy wind currents are. And so a lot of the renewable resources that we're after, the power is going to be generated in the West. So we need to know, we need to supply the energy where it needs to go. We need to have, um, you know, we need to have these grid systems so the energy can get where it needs to be. So by far, solar, wind, etc., you know, this power is going to be generated outside of urban centers. And probably in the western part of the United States, because the western part of the United States has the most government-owned land. Okay? And now the eastern part of the United States has very little government-owned land, so that would be have to come from an individual putting up power or selling their land, and that's not likely. The government, on the other hand, um, can you know, utilize the land how they see fit, so they can lease the land to, um, you know, solar companies or wind companies or natural gas companies like they currently do, and then that energy can be supplied to uh, the grid. So when President Obama was in office, he proposed to spend roughly four and a half billion dollars to expand the power grid in the United States. Okay. This was shot down and never was put. Um, it was never funded, but uh, his committee or maybe himself um, realized that we have a huge power grid problem in the United States if we're going to go to renewable resources. We cannot just ship the energy like we have been. You can't just suck it out of the ground in the form of fossil fuels and then take it to a plant that's attached to the grid line. Now you're going to have to um, you know, capture that energy in rural areas 
and ship it to urban areas through a grid, through the electrical grid. Um, so the power grid needs updated. Four and a half billion is what they calculated it would cost. Um, President Trump currently is talking about infrastructure, and I'm not entirely sure if this is part of the infrastructure that he's referring to, but we really need to spend um, money on our power grid system because it's very out of date, but it's also not, it's not utilized in the correct way. Um, urban centers uh, have all the power grid, and rural centers have very little power grid, and if your power is going to come from the rural centers or the rural areas, um, it's not going to work. Okay. And then, of course, you know, with all of these systems, you know, the giant power lines and things like that are not going to be welcome from rural areas. Rural people don't want to see power lines. They don't even want to see turbines um, or solar panels. So to combine that with turbines solar panels and now you get these big power lines coming in most people um, are not going to ha um, be happy about that but in order for the United States to decrease the amount of fossil fuel that they consume some things have to happen um, some changes have to happen so the power power transmission okay, this is what the the grid would um, look like we have to have these massive power transmission lines probably you know designed in the Midwest um, and through probably wind energy is going to be supplying the main grid here but the grid itself would run both east and west um, I'm not entirely sure why the grid doesn't run down into um, the southeastern part of the United States it clearly would clearly would have to do that um, but nonetheless, these are just the main grid lines. Um, these would be massive lines that could, uh, you know, carry a huge amount of energy. Uh, and then small grid lines would come off of all of these, like they currently do. But the system needs updated no matter what. Uh, and uh, I'm guessing infrastructure is part of that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to now switch gears just a little bit and start talking about hypothetical um, fuels. Okay? So fuels that maybe haven't been proven to be all that successful um, and are kind of in the developmental stages, things like biofuels, different types of biofuels, algae, things like that. Okay? And so I'm going to talk about that from the purpose of well, is it worth exploring, or should we utilize some of the systems that we already know? Okay, next time.